Thank you for staying with Daybreak. We're talking about 2022 opportunities and where do the opportunities lie is the biggest question. Trevor Mbija at Citizen TV Kenya is the hashtag Daybreak. Be there before we took the break, we were having an argument on, so what does this mean now? It's an election year. So should I invest or not? Because there's a chances that even if it's a matter of dealing with the national government, there's some of them have contracts and uh, of course you can procure a few things. County government, the same thing. But the transition in leadership, sometimes you might not be paid. So should you invest or should you just wait, lock tight, we we'll see what happens after the elections? So let's, uh, let's work with a working example. Let's take maybe a Mike or a Mary and yeah. say um, they're running a business, maybe they have, do we work with 10 million or we work with a million? A what million. What do you think? A million. Yeah. Let's work with a million. So today it's January 2022 and you're asking yourself, I have a million. What do I want to do with this one million? You have two options. You could either decide, I want to do a business. I could sell chicken, I could sell shoes, I could sell etc. or I could provide a service to the government yeah. and I hope to be able to make two million once that comes in, right? So that the question is, when do I expect this two million to come in? If I make that two million, then the question on investment is my one million profit. How do I deploy it in terms of investments? Now we're getting into a political cycle. So you can't ignore the fact that there will be uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen um, when we get into the elections. I think Reginald has mentioned it. You cannot ignore political risk if you're going to make an investment unless you're looking at your investment over five years. If you're saying I can put my one million for five years and I'm indifferent, then you can be able to buy long-term assets. But because of that political uncertainty, and also because of um, where we are getting into in terms of interest rates, you want to hold it in near cash. Maybe a money market where you're getting 6 to 8 or 9% return, depending on where it is, because you can quickly liquidate in case anything happens. If I'm running a business and maybe something, I get a new opportunity, I can go take my 1 million back and go and do something else. In case anything happens and my business falls under, I can still be able to withdraw my 1 million and be able to fund my opportunities. Yeah. Now, if this same person has been putting money aside and maybe has a accumulated uh, an extra one million or an extra two million and they're saying I want to invest for like a five three to seven year period then you want to be looking at assets such as the NSC and seeing okay anytime there's political noise as Waidaka has said KCB does not stop operating because there's political noise if people are lending people are still going to look for money they continue yeah. their operations people don't stop calling on Safaricom because there's been something that's going on. So the operations, the going concern of uh, the companies on the NSC continue, but you want to look at the quality of company, the quality of earnings, the type of customers that they have. So if you see a Safaricom coming off or you see a KCB coming off, an equity or an EABL coming off, you're like, aha, I can be able to buy this and make maybe a 20, 30% return over a two, three year period. Yeah. That's how you're looking at it. The next thing you're asking yourself, because we are in a space of, um, maybe a lot of money, there'll probably be a bit of liquidity that will be coming through in the political cycle. Can I actually look at some opportunities in real estate? Rather than going to say, I'll just buy land and it sits there because yeah. it's not earning, can I actually say, maybe there will be people who'll be earning. Can I look for houses that I can build for, that I can rent for 1,000, 2,000? Yeah. That becomes continuous income. Okay. So when it comes to investments, let me look at it as going to a supermarket. Your needs are different from my needs. They're different from Reginald's needs. They're different from Waidaka's needs. You have to first be very clear, where am I at? Yeah. Then make a clear, uh, decision in terms of, these are the opportunities. There are numerous investment opportunities opportunities mm -hmm. look at it and look at it vis-a-vis -vis your risk and then now make a choice and say for 2022 mm -hmm. I want to make an investment of 1 million my minimum return is 20% and I either want to do it for a short-term basis or a long-term basis okay. but in some there will be opportunities on the NSC depending yeah. on the timing look at the volatility and decide when an entry point makes sense but hold near cash and then the other thing that you want to consider is people keep asking should I hold dollars should I not hold dollars? If you can hold dollars and hold a dollar account that gives you uh, maybe two to three or uh, four percent return, depending on where you're investing it, you can hold on to that and see. Because if the currency weakens, then you'll probably be getting more shillings if you are holding dollars. Maybe those are some of the considerations that are actually put out there. Yeah, we'll actually come to the dollars and the shillings part in just a bit. Right? But Waidaka, direct question. Is this the time to invest in counties? <laughs> because we know there's pending bills left, right, and center. Is this the time to do it or just don't do it now? I think, I think it's Reginald who mentioned it earlier. Yeah. In, in passing, you invest where you understand. If you don't understand, you will miss out on the opportunity that is there. 
Yeah. Just the same way as we talk about businesses. Do not start a business that you don't understand. There's the famous quail eggs business that we yes. had in this country. The reason that people lost money is because they didn't understand the market. I, we do this in our class all the time at Centonum. We ask people, how many people here have eaten a quail egg mm. in the last two years, 10 years? Even in this room, if I was to ask, I can, I can see most people have never even eaten one. But imagine there are people who eat quail eggs in this country. There are people who eat quail itself. Yeah. Those are, it is a viable market. Those who are selling it understand the market because they know it is a, it is a niche market, it's a small area, and they're making good money because the return is obviously higher than on a chicken. Yeah. But if I look around here and I ask how many people have eaten chicken in the last couple of days, probably everybody in, in a week has at least had a chicken leg. So what does that mean? There may be opportunities as far as that is concerned. Invest where you understand. So if the, definitely, look, as we've been talking about here, the policy now is for devolution. They are trying to move a lot of the functions into the counties. Hey, the cities, especially like city like Nairobi, is becoming congested. We are trying to move away from these places. What does that mean? Yeah. As people move into Kiambu, as they move into Machakos, as they move into those areas, doesn't that mean that a market is growing there? But are you prepared for that market? Do you have the skill set to draw from that market? Because the, there is... Don't just follow people where they, they, they are, you're hearing they are doing a good thing over there, mm. unless you have the skill set and the ability to draw from that. If you have it, go. If you don't, look where your skill set, networks, abilities are going to allow you to be able to invest. And when I say abilities, I mean also the amount you have. Because to invest in the county, and you're talking about an investment like that, it may require that 10 million. Yeah. Whereas you, maybe you have 100,000 to invest. That 100,000, get a motorbike and start riding in your estate because you know the people there and you have goodwill. Yeah. Do you see the difference? So it is about understanding, matching your skill set and abilities to the investments that's there. There may be very good opportunities in the county. Look at them and see how they match your, your needs. Skill set. Mm -hmm. Reginald, what do you think? You and I have talked about this issue of counties and pending bills for quite some time. And considering now there's also a trans it's a transition year as well, the current governor may not be the one who's coming in. He's probably done his two terms. They still have pending bills from way back. Is this even the time to consider getting into those contracts and tenders? Uh, my, my personal advice, invest in the county, not with the county government. Uh, the same as say invest in Kenya, but not necessarily with the Kenyan government. It is said that uh, most of the demand that we have in the country is, has been through uh, fiscally induced demand. So it's the government spending. Um, so you end up having to have connections and all that. But nothing stops you from going to one. Again, you have to do an analysis of, of, of a county and say, okay, pro the probability of the counties in terms of growing uh, or attracting investments and people, uh, maybe with this county and this county and this county, then you look at what are the things that will be lacking if people are to move into that county. Because the idea of devolution is people, one, staying in that place and not having to come to Nairobi to look for work. Um, if businesses start running there, what, what are the other things that can be done to ensure that people are there? Um, so if, if I think that um, in the next three, four years, um, um, the county of uh, Narok, uh, Narok is a county, yeah? yeah. The yes. county of Narok is going to start uh, uh, booming and growing, yeah? Why not go buy land now uh, when it's still cheap? But when it starts booming, the land starts becoming expensive. Why not go buy your land now uh, and start slowly maybe building accommodation? Uh, or what are those things that people in Narok travel to Nairobi to buy? Can you bring them it closer to them? Um, again, knowing that you're not going to open the shop now and become a trillionaire the next day, you're opening a shop now knowing that way as the county also grows, the demand for my products grow, so you also, your level of investment goes with the, the level of demand that you have in that county. So I will invest in a county, but not with a county government. I will not go for a contract with the county government. I will not go uh, for a tender with the county government. And, and most of these uh, tenders and contracts, we are better off being approached because they've seen your ability so that you do it at your own terms and conditions than when you want to go and try to become a, a tenderpreneur. Um, then th that becomes very murky waters. Yeah, so invest in a county, not with the county. <laughs> That's an interesting perspective. And uh, you were talking about, you are talking about dollars and uh, Kenya shillings. So 
what should one think of doing right now? Should you convert your money to dollars? Is that a better risk or what happens? Or if you have some dollars, should you get your shillings now because it is quite, it's skyrocketing as we speak? It also depends on where you're at. Yeah. So if, uh, if I'm in the, the United States of America, my opportunities for investing are probably not as vibrant as they were last year. So if I'm holding dollars, then there's an opportunity to come and deploy those dollars into assets in Kenya. So if you're going to buy land, maybe at the county, if you're going to buy stocks, you could probably be getting um, more shillings as we get into the election cycle just because of that volatility. So you could be considering that. Yeah. Now, if on the flip side, you're in Kenya today and um, you're asking yourself, I have these shillings, should I convert my shillings to dollars? If you have already converted to dollars, then you want to hold them in dollars just for a little while. Because anytime there's any political, um, um, uh, a key political event happening, and also for us, when you're looking at the rise in interest rates in the United States of America, then that could also trickle down, have a trickle down effect on where we are at now. So I'm not, um, I don't have a range, I haven't done a range of where the currency could close at, yeah. but I think there could be an opportunity to earn, um, single digit higher single digit returns yeah. in dollars especially as we get into the election cycle so if you want to hold it you can hold it up until then yeah. but i would not say take all your shillings and convert into dollars because there'll still op be, be opportunities to invest yeah. in, uh, in kenya shilling assets mm. so it really depends on where you're at but i think what is more important is to say um why am i investing so one of the key questions that we get from most of the people we engage with, they'll say, I want to hold dollars because my kids are going to university next year or the year after, or, and I need to be able to make a payment in dollars. So for that person, they're questioning, should I be exchanging today at the current rate or will I be worse off? So you see, for such a person, because there's a direct need for holding those dollars, then you're telling them maybe you need to be converting into dollars and holding it for that duration in terms of your waiting period. But somebody else will come and say, I just want for an investment and I want a 15, 20 uh, percent return. Do I need to have the dollars? If you're not talking about $10,000 and above, perhaps not, because there's no need of holding $1,000 and you're not going to do something else. Then the final consideration is to ask, also when it comes to investments, where am I investing? Other people will come and say, you know, I've been looking at, um, foreign assets, um, U.S. stocks, I'm looking at alternative um, uh, coins, Bitcoin, um, Ethereum, etc. Then these people, then there's a need for them to hold dollars. So you can't just be holding an investment for no particular um, uh, need. You want to hold an investment because it's tied to a goal and it's tied to a return and it's tied to a direction yeah. that you are actually looking at for that particular period. Yeah. Well, Daka, what do you think? Because, you know, holding the dollars, is a, it's, it's a tricky conversation. There are those who are saying, if you have it now, this is the time to change them into shillings yeah. because then you'll have a higher return because if you wait longer, it might come back to 109. Yeah. So what do you do now? I, I say you need to get to know a prophet very well yeah. who can see into the future. <laughs> because all of us seated around here, yeah. we are doing our best predictions of what we think may happen and we have, we have no crystal ball that we can see and look into the future. And so can I give you a good investment to make right now yes. that will help you in that direction? Mm. Invest in knowledge. Mm. <laughs> this is the time to pick up a book about finances. Yeah. This is the time to go and sit with financial experts like the ones that you're seeing seated here. This is the time to invest in a class like the ones that we have at Centronomy. Yeah. Because what happens is, is we are overwhelmed by the amount of investments that are out there. As we are hearing, US dollars, stock market, real estate, counties, there's so, there's so much out there so that if you are not being given the proper advice and clarity on what you're going to do, even if we talk about dollars here until kingdom come, we, I know so many people, their eyes are glazing over and they're wondering now, which, where do I begin? Yeah, yeah. And please don't feel that you are alone. One of the best investments that you're going to make is to speak to an investment advisor who will give you the information. And don't go to one, don't go to two. Check out with three of them because each one of them will give you a different perspective. Make that investment. And you'll be so surprised that for many of these investment analysts, the information is free. Especially when you, go to, when you talk about like stock brokers, the information that they give is free. Why? Because they make the money when you purchase the shares or when you sell them. Yeah. That real estate agent that you have been dealing with, they, are in, they make their money off the commissions once they sell. So they want to give you information. But remember, they're giving you uh, information based on they want to sell you something, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So don't just trust one person. Make the investment, Trevor, 
in multiple areas of investment so that then you get a, a, a rounded perspective and make a choice at that point. Yeah. Invest in knowledge right now okay. because it's too much. There's too much. Even here as we've been talking, even me, some of the things I've had to go back to my phone and Google and say, what was that? I, re I remember learning it in a class at some point. It is so important that you get a rounded perspective. So Trevor, if you want a good investment, yeah. invest in knowledge today. Okay. <laughs> Reginald, what do you think? Because, you know, Airborne Pinches here on Twitter says, I think for the dollar one, one, one can check the CBK dollar mean rate for the last one month. Plus, it also depends on which type of business are you dealing in and who are you supplying? Ah, shilling, shilling, shilling. <laughs> Dear shilling. Um, to truth be said, uh, Trevor, which I think my colleagues are trying to run away from speaking because they might be censured by a certain institution since they're operating from, 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 from Kenya. Um, I, I, I still stand with my, 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 my statement which I made um, a couple of years ago that the shilling was overvalued. And every other day we see that that statement is coming true. Um, the, the shilling uh, is more of a managed float, so there's a lot of intervention from the central bank. Uh, to try and smooth it. I, I, I personally believe they have a target range where they want the shilling to uh, to remain. Um, IMF statements of there is enough room to allow the shilling to act as a shock absorber, which they basically just saying in simple English, uh, the shilling can be devalued to uh, absorb, not devalued, it can lose value to absorb external shocks uh, because the central bank is credible and the reserves are a lot, which I think it's a lot of... Um, um, a lot of words just to, to, to just to tell people that don't worry when you see the shilling um, losing value in, in the coming uh, few few periods. So it is going to lose um, uh, ground from where it is currently. Why? One, because the, the room for the central bank to continue defending the shilling is not that large, considering our foreign reserves are pretty much debt driven. So our foreign reserves always grow when we borrow on, on the euro market or when we get money from um, uh, bilateral lenders uh, or commercial lenders. That's when our reserves go up. Uh, without that, uh, we are not generating enough dollars to actually uh, prop up our reserves. Um, when a country's major source of uh, dollars becomes remittances, then you know we're in trouble because then we are dependent on some guy seated in Washington somewhere to decide whether he's going to send his uncle money or not. Mm. Uh, that, that is not national policy. That, that is gambling with, uh, uh, with, with, with fiscal and monetary policy. We are getting into an election, um, and if foreigners... Uh, take the stance that they normally take because our Nairobi Stock Exchange is primarily driven by foreigners, uh, truth to be said. Uh, they're the one that determine whether that thing goes up or goes down. If they decide to pull out, that is uh, dollars leaving um, the country. So you'll find there might be an increase in demand in dollars which will continue to push uh, the shilling uh, down. Now, what does that mean for you as an individual? So now, as an individual, uh, if you want to look at going into dollars, number one, you're looking one at the holding cost of holding those dollars, uh, the return of holding um, dollar-denominated assets. Because you're not just going to keep the money in your in your mattress. Uh, that, that's, there are some gentlemen and ladies in Nairobi that will know that you actually have those dollars under your mattress, and they will find them. So there are costs. Of, of holding those dollars and there's also an opportunity cost of not earning anything. Um, so even if the shilling depreciates by another 10, 15 percent, um, then you say, okay, the opportunity cost there was 6 percent because you could have been in a fixed deposit earning 6 percent. Uh, you had to increase your security. You realize you end up with a 1 percent or 2 percent. Is it really worth it? Um, if, if then you're also a, a business, but the dynamics always differ between individual and a business. If you're a business and your business depends on one, either you receiving uh, whatever you sell in dollars or you're an exporter, uh, or you're an importer and your key components are, are bought in dollars, but your revenue is in shillings, then you have a problem there. Do you start uh, dollar indexing your prices locally? to make sure that whatever you're earning, at least on your local revenue, uh, covers your import costs uh, in dollars, so you dollar index your, your, your prices, or do you want to go into an arrangement with a bank and have a, a forward arrangement um, or contract um, where you have a specific uh, exchange rate that you agree for three, four, five months up to now. In Kenya, it's a bit expensive uh, because bank treasuries are just box. 
banks so you find sometimes it's a bit expensive so how, how do you hedge that currency risk that is going to come to your business with the volatility of the shilling and the more uncertain it is the more uncertain it comes uh, where you you order things today and you end up paying two times the amount because the shilling is actually depreciated if you're an exporter most probably you're smiling uh, because then you get your money in dollars, sell in, 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 in uh, you, yeah, you get your money in dollars. As long as your inputs then are in shillings, then you're not really much uh, affected. Yeah. But currency volatility is going to be high and it presents opportunities uh, both as an individual and as, a, uh, and, uh, as, an, uh, as an individual yeah. and risks when you are a business. Because then it affects your cash flow, it affects your, your outflow and inflow. Then um, you find yourself, you have bought something in dollars, what you're getting in shillings doesn't make sense. And that's the crisis we ended up having in the coffee sector. You sell your coffee, um, the shilling is managed, what you're getting and the cost of living or the real value, real prices here locally are higher than what you expected to have with the currency that you got. So you realize building an apartment block on the piece of land and uprooting your coffee becomes a better sense. So it is actually something real that should not be played down, especially for businesses. Yeah. Bide, there's a direct question here from Roy Nyakundi, who okay. says, what's the panelist's opinion on Bitcoin? <laughs> uh, that's a very good question. Thank you so much, um, Roy. I'll answer it in two ways. Should you be investing in Bitcoin? Yeah. And yeah. what's the direction of Bitcoin? I'm not a Bitcoin expert. I just yeah. follow trends. And what we've seen over the last um, one week is it's come down to about $39,000 for a Bitcoin unit. It attached a high of uh, 62, slightly over $60,000 um, in November. How I'm looking at it from my own personal perspective is to say I'm waiting for it to see if it goes lower, but I would want to buy it. I would want it to be part of my portfolio because I can't continue to ignore Bitcoin. But to tell you that tomorrow it will be 40 or 45, I'm not too sure. What you need to be factoring into your investment consideration is if I put $1,000, for example, if it goes to 60, I'll be very happy. If it goes to 20, will I be sad? Will I go break a leg? If I want to break a leg, then go ahead with that decision. So yeah. be happy to be, be comfortable losing your money. So put the amount of money that you're comfortable losing and then watch the trends. But I would say you want to have Bitcoin in your portfolio. Should Bitcoin be your first investment? I'm not too sure it should be your first and only investment. Perhaps if you've made money from other investments, then you can redeploy. Then the second element of looking at Bitcoin, when I look at like my own personal investment portfolio, I have some houses, some real estate opportunities. Yeah. And of late, I've been having this conversation with my friends. They're like, these houses we bought in 2014, if we bought Bitcoin with the same amount of money, mm -hmm. we'd be in a very different place. Yeah. So what we, our learning has been, we can't continue to ignore alternative assets. You have to be able to understand them and invest in them. But then again, you don't want to invest your entire portfolio in them because they're very sporadic. They go up and they go down. Okay. <laughs> Daka, what do you think? She's done a it's perfect a direct job. Question, no, I cool. mean, she's done a perfect job. Yeah. Understand it, make yeah. it part of your plan, yeah. understand the potential. These, these would be considered to be extremely high risk. Yeah. And where there's high risk, there is high potential return. So do you think, I think it was 2018 when it, was, it went from $1,000 uh, to over $20,000 in one year, talking about a return of over 1,500% in a year. Yeah. Um, but we've not seen that immediately afterwards it dropped by 70% and then came back up as you've seen last year in November, we're talking about a 50% drop. So the volatility, this is not where you put school fees money, this mm. is not where you put savings, yeah. this is not where you put your retirement investments, no, if you have, if you have extra cash outside where you're willing to take that higher risk for the higher potential return, and I'm using potential over and over again because yeah. we don't know, yeah. then why not? Um, look into it and pe look, Trevor, even in this country there are people who have put their lives into Bitcoin. Yeah. So what does that mean? They are looking at the trends. They are able to see what are other nations doing because it's uh, mostly being driven by Western and Eastern nations, the, the, the market on Bitcoin. So if yeah. you know what's happening in China, if you know what's happening in the States, you know what's happening in Europe, and you're paying attention, you can actually get the return. But most of us, Trevor, we are in our offices. We are busy looking at doing the work that we are doing here, not looking at the international market to see what's going on. Yeah. So we are getting into a much higher risk investment than you'd want to, most okay. likely. Reginald, what is your opinion on cryptocurrencies, especially Bitcoin? This is a direct question from Roy Nyakundi. He says, yeah. what are the panelists' opinion on Bitcoin? Yeah. 
Again, Trevor, well, what are other panelists not telling you <laughs> is if you go into Bitcoin, just go into gamble. When Bitte says she doesn't know, uh, and Oyathama says he doesn't know, it's literally that uh, there, is, there is no analysis you are doing on Bitcoin. Uh, a classic definition of a Ponzi scheme <laughs> is you hype it to make sure that money continues to come into it so that the value continues to go up and you're able to cash out. Yeah, when you have an asset that is primarily just div- uh, driven by the hype around it, because the price of Bitcoin goes up when people want to buy it, they create demand. What is creating the demand? Because someone has said, you know, it made 1,500 percent return last year. It might make the same return. You know, just, just, just. Try. Bitcoin is pure gambling, uh, and 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 literally, there's no calculated risk on uh, Bitcoin. It is pure gambling. I put in money, I hope for the best. That, that's what Bitcoin is. Um, and uh, <laughs> someone quoted Warren Buffett on, on, on the panel. What he said, if you need a calculator to understand something, then you don't understand it. Just, just leave it alone. My, my advice is there are many other investment opportunities that you can um, do to make money. Yeah. The problem of Bitcoin is driven by get-rich-quick uh, mentality. Either you do not do what you're supposed to do in 60 years of your life, you're getting to the end of it, you're thinking, hey, I need to become a millionaire, you jump into Bitcoin. But when we start investing in value, generating uh, ventures, businesses, um, whether it's financial or real businesses, then we need to have the patience for these um, investments to, to, to grow. So my advice on, on Bitcoin, I think it's pure gambling. Yeah. Uh, no one can actually come and say, I've... Uh, calculated the intrinsic value of Bitcoin, uh, as in the, the, it's valued today at 20,000, but it's undervalued, you know, so this is the right time to buy. Uh, or hey, at 20,000, it's overvalued, I think it's going to come down, this is the right time to, uh, to, to sell. Um, and there is also a difference between digital currency and, uh, and, 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 and your Bitcoins and all. Uh, if, if the central bank issues a digital currency, um, then it's as good as issuing Kenya shilling, and it's dependent on something. There's something that is backing uh, that currency. Uh, if things go hit the fan, you know where to go. But right now, if the guy who started Bitcoin all of a sudden is found again, uh, the Japanese guy, and he says, oh yeah, I was just playing a game. Those are trillions of dollars that are going to be wiped out. And if you look at the statistics, as much as uh, people are saying it's driven by the West and, and the East, uh, the highest traders of Bitcoin are actually from the African okay. continent. Uh, your Nigerians uh, and people are competing on the continent to be the highest uh, traders of Bitcoin. And you ask yourself, why? Why is not the U.S. the highest traders of, of, of Bitcoin? You know, why, why is uh, Japan itself not the highest traders of Bitcoin? Why, why is it an African country? Um, because of wanting to get rich and out of poverty uh, using shortcuts. So for me, Bitcoin is pure gambling. Um, if you are a gambler, if you go to casinos, yes, add Bitcoin to your portfolio. Um, but from a professional perspective, uh, just keep it away from your portfolio. Unless you just want to gamble and try. Like what Bide said, you can throw in $1,000 and, and, and hope for the best. Okay. So for you, it's pure gambling. Bide, is agriculture the way to go? Because just a few weeks ago, there was a lot of debate after KFC said they ran out of potatoes because they, they import from Egypt. And everybody was like, we have potatoes right here. So is agriculture the way to go, and should we then put our standards into the international level? Yeah. Um, so we rebased the GDP of Kenya, yeah. and the importance of agriculture is not as what we have always expected or anticipated. We used to think it's um, a primary, um, it's, it's the core in terms of uh, its contribution to GDP, which I think was 30, 35%. But once the GDP of the country was rebased last year, it's actually 22%. And I think you have to factor that perhaps our perceptions are putting so much importance on agriculture, and maybe it's not as important. But that said, you have to look at, um, I think I'd look at agriculture is how do I add value into some things and do you understand agriculture? I'd really love to be in that sector. I don't even know the first thing about digging a hole for potatoes. I, then all my friends who are in that space, they're always getting burned. Because I think the greatest one is 
uh, people who grow wheat or barley in yeah. Molo. It's always, we have to get there. This is how I look at it. The people are going to probably be able to add uh, value to products. I take tea and I add some flavors, I repackage it, and I sell it. That's easier because I'm taking a primary product and I'm adding value to it. I take coffee and I add value to it. Yeah. I take oats and I probably make oat cookies and other things. That will be very valuable to you. And more importantly, I think when DRC gets into the East African community, it's creating a lot more mouths that need to be fed and the barriers to entry are leaner. So when you look at agriculture rather than being a primary provider, it's asking yourself, if I'm looking for income, how can I participate by adding value mm. to some of these things? You're probably mitigating your risk. So I'm not saying ignore agriculture, but I'm saying be realistic. You do you understand agriculture? Yeah. Yes or no? If not, do you understand the people around your social circles? What do they like to consume? I know the people around my circles like to consume smoothies. So this morning I was like, how can I start packaging smoothies and then um, get a cab certification and yeah. increase the longevity from a few hours to a day so that I can sell that to them? That for me makes sense as a, put, as a space to put my money and to be able to create value add. Yeah, but this understanding that you keep talking about, you can also have people, hire people understand. You can. Yeah, I mean, you if, can. If you Absolutely. don't understand much about agriculture, you, if you, you see can the, have absolutely. people do it for you, people understand it, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Trevor, this is how I look at money, whether yeah. you're employed or whatever. If I have 10 million today, it's just a basic question of how is my 10 million going to grow? What's the fastest route to make it grow? Yeah. If I look at 10 million and I say, um, I want to go put 10 million down and start an agricultural farm and because I'm sure that my 10 million will be 15 million and I understand how I'm going to get it to 15 million, that's okay. Somebody else could come and say, I have my 10 million, me, I want to go buy iron sheets and sell them or I want to buy um, construction products and sell them. But if I come back to the opportunities, I think when you look at the Kenyan economy, there are opportunities in trade, um, there are a lot of opportunities in transport, distribution, moving things from point A to point B. Uh, Matatus, which is another story altogether, but people need to move back and forth. Yeah. There are opportunities in service provision. What do people need? All these um, MSMEs, people with one, two, three businesses, what do they need? So if I'm going to go and take labor, put people in a space, and then put capital in that space, the question is, what's the best route for me at that point in time to be able to deploy? And certainly agriculture is not the best, it's not the worst, it depends on where you're at. Yeah. Wedak, uh, have you given lessons at St. Tonomy and told people that go the agriculture way? No. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> because, Trevor, I did not say yeah. that you should not get into agriculture. I said we don't tell people which business to get into. Mm -hmm. Business is driven by opportunity and market. Is there a market for what you're getting into? And the, the problem that we're having right now is that we're looking at agriculture like subsistence farming, what our great grandparents used to do, which was to feed yourself essentially and your, your, the small community around you. Yeah. Agriculture, if you're talking about it as a business, is a business. What are the fundamentals of that business? What are the risks? And when you talk about in, in a time like this when we have major global risk, risks like uh, the issue of global warming, you have to think how are you going to get water onto your, onto your farm? How are you going to be able to get um, with the travel restrictions? How are you able to get your products around the world? So if you're going to get into agriculture, get into it with, change that word from agriculture to agribusiness. Mm. How am I going to get a return from this? Have I done my due diligence? Have I got enough reserves in place so that I can know that if this crop doesn't come up, if these animals die because of starvation, I'm going to be able to recover and come back again. And a lot of these businesses, when you talk about things like barley, and Bithe was mentioning now, you cannot have half an acre of barley. It makes zero sense. Mm. Such products and, and commodities, you need thousands of acres. That's a kind of investment that you're talking about where there's potential return that you're going to get into. So Trevor, no, we don't have a class where we're going to tell people to get into agriculture. No, we're going to ask you as an entrepreneur, what do you see as an opportunity? Can you be able to see this business breaking even and giving a, a profit over time? Yeah. That is the key. Okay. Not this thing of say, waking up one day and saying, hey, I like avocados, I'm going to get into avocado farming. Mm -hmm. You make a little bit of money, but most of these businesses have no fundamentals. Trevor, a lot of the businesses that are being run now and people come into the Centonomic uh, Entrepreneurship Program, you find they are simply being driven by the persons um, a primary employment. Yeah. So Trevor is seated here, he's being paid by citizen. 
uh, and his money is what is funding the avocado business. Mm. If you remove Trevor's income, that business collapses completely. So as a side hustle, it may work. But as a business, it might not. It may not. Yeah. So this is the time to, if you're getting into agriculture, remove that and say agri-business are the fundamentals in place. Yeah. Reginald? Is that the way to go? Because the, the argument has always been, there will always be mouths to feed wherever you go. And we, which is true. We, we, people will always have to, to eat Trevor. Yeah. Um, the, the problem that we, we have is when we think of business in terms of, one, short-termism. Um, and and it's, a, it's a problem that mostly, um, sorry to say, um, but Africans we have. Look at the Asian community. If, if you look at the most Asians who are running around driving big cars now, they are actually riding on the back of their grandfathers or great-grandfathers who worked hard to build a business, which they may not even have enjoyed the benefits, but they had a long-term perspective, um, and the great-grandchildren are uh, enjoying it. Uh, I want to build a business, I want to be a millionaire now, live in the big house now, drive the bigger, big car now. And yeah. that's why we have uh, a, a shortage of entrepreneurs on the African continent. We have a lot of traders. Yeah, people want to buy this, sell this, turn it around quickly. Turn the one million and make it two million, take two million and three million. And that's why we never end up getting ultra wealthy people because we are, don't have people who are willing to take risk. Because entrepreneurship is taking risk on an opportunity. That the largest um, tomato company in the world is called Morningstar. The, 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 the guy has revenues of $700 million a year. But he didn't start the tomato farm today and make $700 million next year. So if you want to go into agriculture and in any other business, yeah. stop being a trader who wants to turn things around, take that million and turn it into two million next week, take it into three million next week. Even if you look at Elon Musk uh, and Tesla, he didn't start today and next year he was making um, the billions that he has. Look at Amazon, uh, the years it has taken to build it up to there. Then you ask yourself when you look at, say, let's look at the Kenyan space, do we have a business that we can say this thing has been there for 100 years or 80 years, it has grown up to where it is there? No, we have people who want to stick something, turn that 1 million to make it 2 million. So if you want to go into agriculture, uh, go into it as business. Most people will always want to eat uh, and people will always have to eat. Yeah, whether they're going to do the value chain of it and everything and it and stuff like that, be in a position where you know how to lobby uh, government, get market, get the right environment for you to be able to do, understand the product and the produce that you want to do, um, get experts, Trevor, as you said, who have studied agriculture, who know soil types, whether what is best in that area, what can be done, and start. But just have that patience to see your agricultural business um, grow, uh, because there are people um, who are making. I think one of the in the top ten richest people, if I'm not correct, one of them is a pork farmer. His job is just pork. He pigs slash the pigs, make pork and whatever. Literally, just pigs, and he's one of the richest people in the world. Uh, then you come and say, look at the top fifty. Who is that? In the top fifty, there's no guy who's rich because of real estate. Uh, there's no guy who's rich because of earning tracks of land and spinning the land or buying metal sheets from this part of the country, going to sell them at that other part of the country. Um, and, 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 and if we advise people, and I wish even people in Centronomy also can train people to be entrepreneurs, to be willing to take, understand and take risk for long term. Uh, and not just uh, generate short-term people who know how to buy shares, hope it goes up by 30%, sell it, and move on. But people who can buy a stock and continually buy it and say, I want to build it until I'm 5%, 10% owner of this, um, this, this business. Yeah. Or I want to invest in an SME uh, that I know my friend is running, but he doesn't have capital, but I have managerial skills and stuff like that. I'll put in some money there, have a board seat, set whatever, let's grow this business. Yeah. Then we'll start seeing us creating wealth and moving out of people out of poverty. But this short-term turnaround things, being traders, buying things from China, reselling, is, is not really entrepreneurship that will lift anyone out of poverty uh, or create employment. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that's where we need to look at. So if someone has to go into agriculture, um, just know your crop, mm -hmm. get the experts that you need, and go in it for the long term. Don't okay. go in it because you've heard that there's demand for avocados in South Korea or there's demand for 
you know chicken in Ghana or whatever yeah. uh, but go into it knowing that I'm going this for long term yeah. I might not necessarily benefit now to live in a big house in Karen but my children will inherit something um, and my grandchildren will inherit something that becomes actually big employs many people and uplifts the community okay well that, that was a direct challenge to you I'll let you I'll let you respond so what do the classes actually entail so it's exactly that. It mm. is understanding the fundamentals of business. Yeah. One of the biggest issues that as small scale uh, business owners, entrepreneurs starting up is on this continent of Africa is the difference between revenue, which is cash you're making, and profit. Because we have a very strong side hustle culture, we are not building businesses that are profitable. And so when, when people come into a Centonomy class, yeah. we, bega we begin with those fundamentals. Is this business able to generate an actual profit break even and give you a return? Is there a market for the product that you're going to get to? Not in the short term, as Reginald is mentioning, but a long term market when you're talking about things that, are, that will continuously be in demand over time. And then do you have the cash flows and the, st and the, the team yeah. that can be able to get you to that point? Running a business is not just about money. I was shocked. We were doing a consultation with a, a gentleman in the communications business this year. And you're talking about revenues, revenues of over 25 million shillings in a year in a company with three people. So that sounds excellent. Revenues of 25 million with three people. But we, did, we went down to the profitability of the company and we began to see that this business is actually not profitable yeah. because of the costs that are in that business. So when you hear those high numbers and you hear that there's a lot of cash in that business, it does not necessarily mean that there are the margins to make it proper. That's what we do at Centonomy. Mm. So like, if you are interested, please do come. We have a, an open day this Saturday at All Saints Cathedral. Come and sit there and listen to us. It's free. Then you can know, is this something for me or not? If you can come and learn about your business, about the investment, about your career growth, that's what we offer. Yeah. So that when you're getting into the market, and unlike Mr. Waidaka, the reason I'm employed now at Centonomy is because my business failed. When I got into it, I was very taken by the revenues. It was a lot of cash were even being paid in dollars, but I was not watching the profitability on the other side because I had started it as a side hustle. Come and learn. Because that, that's where the difference is. When we talk about businesses that are 100 years old, you can imagine the returns. Yeah. Many people are thinking about this. This is another thing that I hear a lot from Kenyans. I'm investing 100,000 into this business. Mm -hmm. When will it pay me back my 100,000? That's not how entrepreneurs think. Entrepreneurs are not thinking about just the initial investment. They're thinking about the sustained income yeah. from that business. And it is vital. Yeah that we get that knowledge into people. That's why Centonomy is in business. Yeah. And we have been in business you know, for over 13 years, yeah. training in these He said Saturday, because Airborne Pinches is wondering, he says, ask Waidaka Katunia yes. if they have training branches in other towns, yeah. apart from just Nairobi. We so are will, now will online. this be online as well, so we that people can log in wherever they are? We train across the world, Trevor. Yeah. We yeah. train across the world. So even this event on Saturday, if you're in Nairobi, come to All Saints. If you're not, go to all our social media, Centonomy online. We train from Australia to the US. Africans around the world want to learn this information. So you can join us wherever you are. Yeah. Uh, you can be online. If you're in Nairobi, come to All Saints. If you're, if you're not in Nairobi, go to any of our social media. We'll be streaming the event live. All right. Let me see what you're saying online at Trevor Mbija at Citizen TV. Can you use the hashtag Daybreak? Let's bring them up and see what you're saying. I wanted to chime into that before you go yeah, into Yeah, before that. we go into the feedback. Okay. Let's, okay, let's, let's take me there first. Yeah. Okay, just that. Because I was going to yeah. say Centonomy are yeah. our seniors in terms of training. Yeah. But we've also followed that same route in terms yeah. of infallible group and what we also do. Yeah. So... On the, either you're going to, uh, we do business consulting work looking at your corporate valuation, but also on the individual side. Yeah. So what we also offer is we look at your finances as a personal perspective. So like looking at you, Trevor, now, well-dressed, you know, JJ, you're happy, the year is coming. <laughs> you know, you, I think you sound like you already have counting deals coming. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's cash flow, Kujai, no you're way. ready. You're ready for the year. But then the question that I want to come back to before you go to um, what people are seeing online, yeah. have you actually looked at your own finances? What are your assets? What is earning your return? Mm. Who do you owe money? How much are you paying them? What's your cash coming in? What are your expenses? And what are your goals? Have you paid attention to that? Mm. Because you're all over the place. So those are the things that you do on setting up your finances and looking at your 
personalized financial statements yeah. so that you make a decision and that also trickles down to your business mm. so if you're not going to be with the Centonomy team and with all due respect mm. I mean we're always looking up to either and we've actually been inspired by the work that we do we also do financial empowerment and we're also having an investment um, a financial vision board yeah. um, workshop on Tuesday that's also offered online so you can mm. be able to join us look me up that's Smith and Wemore infallible group so that you come and understand where am I at with yeah. my finances what is the one thing what would I like to have happen in this particular year? Okay. Do I want to make a 20% return? Then maybe Bitcoin is the thing that I want to do. Do I want to increase my revenues in terms of um, over and above what I earn from earnings? Do I want to sell eggs? Then what is my target? And then thereafter, what is the choice that I'm going to make? Will I take a money market fund? Will I go buy stocks in Kenya? Will I buy stocks in a foreign space? Will I be investing in my friends' businesses? Or do I want to just buy land? Okay. So that's, I'm also just throwing that out <laughs> there and riding on that conversation. <laughs> Essentially, there are opportunities to be trained yes. and so that you understand how to deal with your finances. Let's, let's see what you're saying online before I take closing remarks on this conversation. Bobo, do you know we know. So in Kenya, corruption and nepotism has corrupted everything, even where an opportunity lies, hence it is difficult to get one. Okay? Okay, Lomolimu says, in 2022, the youth must reduce their appetite for the ever-diminishing and low-paying white-collar jobs. They must be encouraged to invest in the very lucrative agribusiness field in order to make good money, be ready to get your hands dirty. Okay? Charlo Woodrow, he says, provided there's an opportunity and capital is available, investment can be done anytime. Mm -hmm. Elections should not stop one from investing in a good opportunity because elections comes and goes, but it should be done in a conducive political environment and good security. Okay. Airborne says the major problem with Bitcoin is once Tesla and other key investors pull out, <laughs> it will be risky for one to invest in. Okay. <laughs> But Kibe Kenya says, as long as we be, will be peaceful, there's no need to panic. Just invest. Okay. Engineer Lazaro says, agribusiness is the way to go. Government should go ahead and reduce power prices and make it available to low-income people. Okay. Governor 254, he says, what do you need to start a business? Three simple things. Know your product better than anyone. Know your customer and have a burning desire to succeed. You also yeah. need money, Trevor. And you need money. <laughs> Trevor, you can't start a business without capital, please. Yeah. <laughs> okay, being Charlie. It says investing in counties require approvals by county governments. County government elected leaders and their appointed officials are highly corrupt thanks to campaign financing by the criminal enterprise. Investors are a toast, whichever way. Okay. All right, let's take closing remarks, and I'll start with you, Mbide, on this issue of investing. Invest or not? Okay. Final remarks. Final remarks. Yes. Um, you'll either spend time trying to understand the government of Kenya and what everybody else is doing to make money, or you'll actually look at yourself and ask, ask Mbide, what do I want to do this year? I'll leave you with three key things that I want you to, be, uh, to pay attention to. Yeah. Awareness, clarity, and choice. Number one, awareness. Am I aware of my financial situation? Yeah. Have I done a financial health check to understand, as Mbithe, this is where I'm at and where do I want to go? Second thing, clarity. Am I clear on what I want to do in 2022? We have 12 months. The year has just started. What do my priorities need to be? Trevor, if you don't write down what you need to do, you will never do it. Mm. It'll just be an idea that's floating somewhere. The moment you say, I want to increase my earnings by 10%, or I want to increase my investments by 20 or 30%, then I'll be very clear. Okay. Then the final thing is choice. What choices am I making in this January of 2022 to improve my financial well-being? Mm. So anytime you're thinking about yourself, awareness, clarity, choice join the infallible group um vision board party that we're going to be having on tuesday so that you can be able to understand where am i at what do i need to do awareness clarity and choice so that i can be able to enhance my financial freedoms in 2022. all right and uh, reginald closing remarks. uh trevor my, my closing remarks are let's one don't try and do things by yourself yeah. Uh, get into groups so then then you can get economies of scale in terms of your capital you can spread it uh, across and when you get into groups then um, invest in solutions invest in ideas you might not have the idea but invest in someone who has an idea um, the moment we start having entrepreneurs is the moment that we're going to start getting lifting people out of poverty on on, on the continent let's let's see companies that start 
uh, in Kenya, uh, and they start for for the long term and the long haul. So, so my closing remarks, even as we get into 2022, if you are not going to put your money into investment, you want to remain liquid. Um, take this time to brainstorm, uh, to network, come up with uh, like-minded people, and figure out how can we provide solutions to problems that you are seeing, um, and and take that risk. Because if we don't take risks. Um, and, and Kenyans don't like taking risks, and that's why you'll see that if you look at the collective investment scheme industry, uh, close to 90%, 95% of all the money is in money market funds. Because everyone just wants the 6 7% mm. uh, compounding, and that, that's, that's it, average. Um, but let's take risks, come together, let's take risks, and let's that entrepreneurial spirit uh, actually start. And there's a difference between entrepreneurs and traders. So don't yeah. come together, go buy things from China to resell, and you say you are entrepreneurs. No, you are traders. Yeah, but come up with solutions to problems. Is it in the education sector? Is it in the the, the health sector? Is it at the county level? Is it in housing? Um, apply yourselves there. It will take long, but the benefits will definitely be better uh, than the short-term rewards that will come. Okay, wait, Daka. Be strategic. And the biggest investment that you should make today, right now, is knowledge. Because the knowledge is going to give you the opportunity to make that investment. And you have no excuse. You have had Mbithe's invitation. I'm inviting you. This Saturday, 10 AM, you'll be able to learn for free how do I invest in a business, how do I invest for myself, and how do I grow my career. Learn so that you can be able to grow. Okay. You have no excuse. And if you don't like Central, you don't like other, go pick up a book from somebody else. We have no excuses as Africans to remain begging from the rest of the world. We have the same ability, yeah. the same knowledge, the same opportunities ahead of us. The only thing is capital. And as you can hear from what Reginald has said, if we can pull our capital, this idea of the chama, yeah. of us working together, yeah. We can do it. Let's right. do it together. All right. Thank Remember you so much. Remember, final part on that one for chamas. Yeah. Do you know our, all our money? We put it into money markets and we put it as bank deposits. Yeah. And we earn zero percent. What if we actually took it together and we decided <laughs> we're going to put your money in this venture, but you have to give us a minimum return of either ten yeah. or fifteen percent, mm -hmm. and we held each other accountable? Where would we be in a year, or if not in another decade or so? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. In our training for chamas, we have seen that same attitude. Yeah. You know, this idea of looking for where, the, where is the opportunity, and who in that group there. even has skills in real estate. Yeah. So people have fi they've quit their job and become the managing director of their chama, the chama. because of a skill set that, that they, they have. have. Right. And that's the kind of investment Re Reginald is talking about. Yeah. Trevor, the opportunities are in Africa. When, he, when Reginald said, our market is driven by foreign investment. Yeah. Why is America's money here? Why is China's money here? Why is the Europe's money here? Because yeah. where is growth in this, in this world? Yeah. In Africa. In Africa. Right. So Trevor, Thank you, you give us your perspective, yeah. your goals, mm. so that when we come back okay. a year from now, we know where you're at. Well, thank you to me and see you in turn of me and with them women economists. So thank you so much for making time. Reginald Kazutu, CEO of Amana Capital, and Honorable David Osi and CAS Trade and Industry sent in his apologies. He couldn't make it. He had to jump into a business meeting and also a conversation we'll have later on. Health and lifestyle is coming up in just a bit with Felix Okot, Odero, and Willis Bazuraburu. They're talking about fat diets, you know, those diets that people come up with just for a period of time with the resolutions of New Year's. You know what I know is healthy food. I